Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Shh. We're getting ready to start. Let's pull it in. How's everybody tonight? Good. Yeah. Everybody looks so excited and <laughs> I see Sunday Mercy's waving in her sleep. Look at God. <laughs> It's good to see you all tonight. You look beautiful out there. Well, let's go ahead and start our prayer, and we're going to stand up, and we're going to worship the Lord together tonight. And then we're going to hear a wonderful word from the Lord. You ready? Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful to you. You're good and you have extended your goodness to us and we appreciate it because we needed it so bad. Thank you, Lord, that you are with us and in us and that you choose to do mighty things when we gather together in your name. You said that you're in our midst. Thank you, Lord, for the gifts that flow through the body of Christ and how you edify each other as we yield our members to you, O oh God. We need to hear from you tonight a word that will uplift us, that will humble us, that will strengthen us, that will enlighten us, that will reveal who you are to us in a clearer and deeper way. Glorify yourself tonight, O oh God, in everything that is done. Empower us, Lord to hear you, to see you, and to feel you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. When we think of Jesus, we think of the lowly, humble servant that he came to be when he came on earth. he chose to dwell in the body of a human being but in the book of Revelation it talks about Jesus in his glory and his majesty and the wonder that he displayed before he came to the earth and that's the Jesus that's coming back brightness and extravagance so we're going to start with Revelation 19 hallelujah salvation and glory power and honor be to the Lord our God let's let's rise Potent. The Lord our God, He is one. 
Is this thing on? Am I good? All right. Could everybody hear me? Good evening. And before um, I do announcements today, we're going to take offering first. And I'm just going to pray for the offering today, all right? So everybody, please bow your head and close your eyes. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you, Father, that we can give, Father, and freely give, freely give Lord. Oh, Lord, when I think about the offering, Father, I think about the widow's offering, oh, Lord. Let us give out of a place of abundance, Father, no matter how small. Father, let us know that it will make a difference, not only in the church, not only in the community, but in your kingdom, Lord. I thank you today in your name, Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. Amen. All right, guys, the first announcement is... 
um, on Friday, coming up at 7 p.m., we're going to have the premiere of Good Guys Doing Good, starring our very own Josh Kranz. If you guys want to clap it up for him, you can. So that's going to be next Friday here at 7 p.m. Go to the next slide. And the second announcement I have today is we're going to, beginning this week, we're going to have 52 days of, of prayer for the city of Coatesville. Um, this week's theme is street to street, so we're going to go to different streets in Coatesville and pray. And I think all the churches in the community are going to be doing this. All right. Next slide, my favorite thing to do, have breakfast with my brothers. So on June 18th at 9 a.m., we're going to have men's breakfast at 9 a.m. at Double D's Diner. And you guys know where that is. If you guys haven't ever come to one, please come and join us. I always talk about why LeBron James is better than Michael Jordan. And I always win that vote. So next slide. All right. And we have a brunch at Kristen's. Ladies, join us for a woman's brunch June 18th at 11 a.m. 111 Rosemary Lane, Glenmore, PA, 19343. If you are able, please bring food or drinks to share. And that's, oh, oh, you're fine. Next slide. We're going to have church at the camp at Old Mill, fourth Sundays, oh, <laughs> June 4th, Sundays, July and August, June 26th, at 6 p.m. July 3rd, um, July 24th, and August 28th. All right, guys. Um, so, Josh, come on up. That's all the announcements for today. So, thank you guys very much. Let's give it up for Sanjay for being able to read. <laughs> Sanjay, you read the screen so well. Thank you. <laughs> um, it is my honor tonight, oh, to let the kids leave ch for children's, serve, uh, children's Church up to fifth grade. And while they are leaving, um, I'm going to pray for... The message tonight, but we have an honor tonight. It's my honor to have my brother, my older brother Tim, here tonight. And um, he is the pastor of Wagontown Chapel in Wagontown, Pennsylvania. He's been there a pastor for how many years, Tim? 17 years. Um, and one of the things, uh, wonderful husband, father, he's got four boys, four sons, and wonderful brother, one of, the, one of the reasons why I want him to come here and just see what God's doing here, but he's been a, a wonderful example to me. My dad's uh, an amazing example to me in my life, and but I have an older brother that's a pastor as well, that's been pastoring 17 years, and one of the things that Tim models for me as a, pa as a young pastor is how he loves his congregation and shepherds them well. And most pastors nowadays... Um, sit in their office all week long and maybe study and answer phone calls. But a lot of, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of pastors have other people in the church do everything for them. All the visitations and all the administrative, like every, you know, Tim's one of those old school guys, even though he's not old school, that does it all. He's a pastor's pastor and a shepherd's shepherd. And, and he's a wonderful example to me. At, to be a pastor, and I want to be like that. I want to love my church and love my congregation and shepherd well. Um, and, and so I wanted him to come and preach tonight. He's an amazing preacher too. So um, let's give him a welcome, and I'll pray for him as he comes. <laughs> Lord Jesus, bless your word tonight. Be with Tim. Thank you that he's here. Um, it's probably been a long day. He's already preached once today. and um, But give him your words tonight, and uh, may it penetrate our hearts, Lord, by the power of your spirit. Um, and may we be impacted by your word tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Josh. 
I appreciate all the kind words, but I am nothing without Jesus. I'll tell you that right off the bat. So, I'm nothing without Jesus. So, none of us are, right? None of us are. I uh, was, you know, when Josh asked me to come preach, I um, was praying about what the Lord was going to lay on my heart. And, and uh, so, what I'm going to give you was I feel like he laid on my heart tonight to share here tonight. And I, I hope it's a blessing for you. But I always say... To my own congregation, the same thing I'm going to tell you tonight is that I am preaching to myself. You happen to just be listening in, okay? So I need it as much as anybody else does. Um, And so I want to uh, just give the Lord credit in every area and uh, make sure my hope tonight is for you and for me to leave here either knowing something more about the goodness and graciousness of God or to be reminded of what you already know. And so, um, if I can have you leave here talking about Jesus, then uh, that's, that's what I come to do. So, but um, I know Josh just prayed, but I always like to just ask the Lord for my own personal help, because again, without him, I'm nothing. So let me just pray just quickly again, and we'll jump in. Heavenly Father, I thank you for tonight. I pray that you would bless the time together we have. Most importantly, may your word penetrate our hearts, but we know that our hearts have to be ready and ripe to receive the word. God, we pray that our, the soil of our hearts would be able to receive the seed, Lord, from your word. I pray these things in my own life as I need these things as much as anybody else does here tonight. And I pray that we would uh, know you more tonight. Leave here talking all about you, for your name alone is worthy. We ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I came across an illustration years ago. It's not my illustration. I don't even know where I got it from, but it's not mine. And so I can't give credit where credit's due, but it's not mine. So I just want to share the illustration quickly to kind of introduce tonight. But there were two traveling angels that had stopped to spend the night in the home of a wealthy family. The family was rude and refused to let the angels stay in the mansion's guest room. Instead, the angels were given a small space in a cold basement. And as they made their bed on the hard floor, the older angel saw a hole in the wall and repaired it. When the younger angel asked the older angel... He replied, things aren't always what they seem. The next night, the pair came to rest at the house of a very poor, very hospitable farmer and his wife. After sharing what little food that they had, the couple let the angels sleep in their own bed where they could have a good night's rest. When the sun came up the next morning, the angel found the farmer and his wife in tears. Their only cow, whose whose milk had been their sole income, lay dead in the field. The younger angel was infuriated and asked the older angel, how could you have let this happen? The first man had everything and you helped him. But the second family had very little but was willing to share everything and you let their cow die. Things aren't always what they seem, said the older angel. When we stayed in the basement of the mansion, I noticed that there was gold stored in a hole in the wall. So since the owner was so obsessed with greed and unwilling to share his good fortune, I sealed the wall so he wouldn't see it. Then last night as we slept in the farmer's bed, the angel of death came for his wife, but I gave him the cow instead. Things aren't always what they seem. You know, we live in a, we live in a time and age, especially in our life now, today, and all that's happening not only within our own culture and society and nationally and worldly today. You can't even turn the news on and be heartbroken of what we see. And sometimes we don't have a proper perspective, as is what is happening. And tonight, you know, I want to share with you and with me that I want to help us to be maybe redirected so that we would have a proper perspective of God. In fact, I believe that our proper biblical perspective of God is that which really will come and show what's on our hearts, where our thoughts go, and what our actions are to be. Because I'm going to tell you this. Deep down, your perspective of God, whether it's right or wrong, will dictate how you think and how you act and what you do. So we have to have a correct biblical aspect and perspective of God. Because if you don't, things aren't always what they seem. 
And so my hope tonight is that we see that. Our text tonight, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 22. 2 Samuel 22, let me just set the tone here. This is David writing. He has had so much happen in his life up to this point. David has gone through much. He's had his, his daughter raped and his son chasing his life and wanting to kill him, his son Absalom, and all of this. And before that, prior to all of that, Saul chasing for his life. Saul wanting to kill him, David having to spend time in caves hiding out. And so all of these things transpiring in David's life. And there was a big whirlwind of events that happened in David's life, some to which he brought upon himself. But in all aspects, David looking at everything around him and seeing what's going on, and we see where our world is today, we see where our our country is today. We even see where we are today, if you have a right view of God. Yes. And we say, you know, what is it that we ought to be doing? Where should our minds be? Where should our hearts be? And I want to tell you that the greatest answer that I can give you is fixed on Jesus. And when you're fixed on Jesus properly and have a proper perspective of Jesus Christ, God himself, it will bloom and blossom in your own life, which can affect our community, our society, our nation, and our world. You know, next Sunday is Father's Day. And it's been said, and this is another statement that's not of mine that I've heard before, and a lot of times I get it wrong. Hopefully I get it right tonight. But the statement goes something like this. As goes the man, goes, so goes the home. As goes the home, so goes the church. As goes the church, so goes the nation. And so when we look at where our nation is tonight, where has it begun? With mankind. The home, the church. And the fingers point at you and me. So having a proper perspective of God a biblical perspective of God, because people have a lot of different perspectives of God. People view God in many different ways, and you can have a wrong view of God. People view God as like Santa Claus. You know, when you do bad, you know, you get the cold. That's, you know, there's punishment. If you do good, then there's great reward. Some people view God as the man upstairs. I hear that all the time, the man upstairs. You know what happens when you have that perspective of God? Number one, if he's the man upstairs, he's distant, and that's where you tend to leave him, and he's a distant God in your mind. He's also many times like the grandfather type, right? You know, grandfathers are, and grand grandmothers is too. You know, you have kids, I have four boys, and so I can take my boys over, over, to, my, over to my parents' house, and they can watch them when they were younger, and my parents never did this, so I don't think they did. But, as, you know, they can love all my, grandkids, all, my, all my boys and do all that. But if my boys are back, guess what my parents can do? They're your, parents. They're your kids, not mine. And they can get them right back. And people have a view of God in that way. They're not all biblical views of God. And I want to give you a view of God to which David sees. And David's perspective of God in the midst of everything that he has gone through and is going through. And see where his mind is drawn. Now, I can give you a lot more perspective of God, but we don't have time tonight. The greatest thing that I could share with you is the attributes of God and who God really is. And I always like to start, and I know every attribute of God is equally proportioned all through him. There is not one attribute that is greater than another. But if I personally were to focus on one attribute... It would be his holiness. It would be the holiness of God. Because when you see God as holy, you will see you as you really are. A sinner in need of a savior. And that's every day. I realize I need Jesus more now than I did before I even knew him, obviously. Sin separates us from a holy God, does it not? So the holiness of God, but our perspective of God is so critical. I want you to turn again. I already have you there. Second Samuel chapter 22. 
And let me just read just the first few verses. One through seven is what I'm going to look at quickly tonight. It says this, And David spoke unto the Lord the words of this song in this day that the Lord had been, that had delivered him out of the hand of all of his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, the God of my rock. In him will I trust. He is my shield. He's the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my savior. Thou sayest me from violence. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. When the ways of death come past me and the floods of ungodly men make me afraid, the sorrow of hell can pass me about. The snares of death prevent me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God, and he did hear my voice out of his temple, and my cry did enter his ears. I don't know if you caught it. You probably didn't just in the quick glance of the reading here, but the word my is written 10 different times in describing God, one other time describing his own cry. But David says of God that he is my. Can you say that tonight? Is he your God? Is he your personal God? Your personal Savior? Because if you don't have that, your perspective of God is going to be always way off. But I, I, I wholeheartedly believe that it begins at who God is. Your view of God will see you for who you really are, which will point you either to see it and not change or to change and turn to Christ and be obedient to his word to the best that we can only by the power of God that worketh in us. The perspective of God is so vitally important, and it's a proper one that you have to have. As I said, everybody has a proper perspective, has a, has a perspective of God. You could have 100 people, and you could, and you could um, have them lined up and ask them, who is God, who is God, who is God, and most likely you'll get 100 different answers. I personally don't care what other people say about God. I care about what this says about God. Who does... God say he is. And tonight, you can hear what I have to say, not only from what for me, but from what the Lord's telling, uh, who has laid on my heart what to share. But even me, I would say, make sure you go to this and make sure that Tim Cranes is on point. Because you have to get it from the word of God. There's false realities of who God is today. And how we view sin really dictates how we view God. If we minimize sin, you ultimately minimize God. Because sin to God is, is a, is a hor horrible thing. And when you have a holy God, sin is always sin. You can't justify it. You can't water it down before a holy God. And David knows this all so well, does he not? One that would sleep with Bathsheba. One that would send Bathsheba's husband to the front line so that he would die. So that he would hide, hopefully, his sin. But God knows all things. And David would write about that even more in Psalms 139. That there's no place that you can go that God is not there. The omnipresence of God being everywhere. But let's look at this real quick. In verse 2. He said, the Lord is my rock, my rock. The rock. You know, I see up behind me here the great story and the great parable of the man who built his house upon the rock and that it stood when trying times came or when the rain came in the parable. And then compared to the foolish man who built his house upon the sand. So David's not only saying that God is a rock, but he is personalizing it and saying that God is my rock. There's a difference between saying, yeah, I know God. I know he does this and does this. But is he your rock? Is he your foundation? 
David explains it in verses 34 and, 30 and 37 here. I mean, the same, in the same chapter, you looked over just a few, few verses. He says, he maketh my feet like hind's feet. That's like a deer's feet. And he setteth me upon the place high places. Verse 37, thou hast enlarged my steps under me so that my feet do not slip. Have you ever seen on those wildlife stations or one of those wildlife whatever channels or whatever and you're and you're watching like these like snow leopards chasing after one kind of animal a certain kind of animal like a goat or like a sheep of some sort and the cliff is like this and as that snow leopard or whatever animal predator it is that's chasing after it that that goat or whatever it is that sheep can bounce up and down that cliff face like it is walking on this. And you say, how in the world can this thing maneuver so fast and so quick and be able to have its, its hooves cling to an edge of a, of a cliff just barely millimeters? And this is what I read when David writes that in verse 34. He makes my feet like hind feet. So that no matter what circumstance you find yourself in, if he is your rock and your circumstance looks like this, oh, he can get you through, can he? He gives you those hinds feet. But it's not you or me. It's, it's what he gives. It's nothing in part of me that I could ever do. For with me, I can do nothing. So when everything around us seems to be falling apart and everything's a struggle, everything breaks the heart of us, it ought to break the heart of us. If it breaks the heart of God, it ought to break our hearts. Let, me be, let, let us be reminded tonight that he is our rock, our foundation. He says he's my fortress, my fortress. Beautiful picture here of the fortress, protection. He's a place that you can run to to find safety, and the, it's a place of confidence. It's a place of, of ultimate safety. Remember when we were kids, if you were kids and you were playing tag or whatever else, and you had some sort of base or whatever that nobody could tag you in that spot, you were safe. It wasn't fair for somebody to tag you. But Christ is that everlasting fortress, that one to where we could run to. You know, we sang that song, we sing that song through our life. I'm sure you sang it no matter how old you are tonight. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He is our fortress. Psalms 24 verse 1, it says this. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the world and they that dwell therein. Everything is the Lord's. So if he is our place of fortress, if he is the place to where we can find safety, protection, there's no authority in this world that isn't in position that God has not allowed it to be. So we can rest in him, can't we? And David says, he's my fortress. David's ultimately saying, he's a place that I can rest in. He's a place that I can be confident in. Remember when Jesus was, bef was before Pilate, just, just a few, whatever, hours before he's about to be crucified, and, and Pilate says to Jesus, do you not know I have authority to save your life? And do you remember what Jesus' response was? You have no authority given to you except that which my Father in heaven has given to you. See, when you have a perspective of God being your fortress, even when things are falling apart around us, you can remember that he's a sovereign God and he's got the whole world in his hands, our fortress. He goes on to say that he is my deliverer, my deliverer. Oh, what a beautiful picture here that God is not only one that can personally protect you, but he is also one that will deliver you. 
Now, this doesn't mean that he's going to deliver you out of every circumstance. It doesn't mean that if you're battling cancer tonight that he's going to, that he's going to cure everything that you're dealing with. He ultimately has delivered you. The cross is really what delivers us. So in the end game is really that when everything goes on, no matter what you're facing, if you know Christ is your personal Savior, if you're born again by faith alone in Jesus Christ tonight, that he has already delivered you. But David also referencing here just the times in his own life the times where Saul was in the same cave as he was. And David snuck up on Saul, and remember, he cut a little piece of his robe. David would express many times through the Psalms, and in, in these times when, when Saul was chasing for his life, he would say something along these lines, that like, that like death, and I'm paraphrasing here, that like death was at my doorstep. And yet the Lord delivered him. How many times was, do we not know that when he was a little shepherd boy and lions or whatever was attacking the sheep to which he had the slingshot preparing for the day that he would face Goliath and that God had delivered him from wild animals. In fact, God delivered him from Goliath. It was nothing in and of David that did anything that day. It was that God had already given him over to him. But David could have looked at Goliath that day as the rest of the army and said, man, he's so big. This, what can I do? But instead, David may have looked at him and said, he's so big. How can I miss? But it wasn't David. It was God. God used David. So it was ultimately God who had helped him. But David had been, been delivered as well. Psalms 34. I love Psalms 34, written by David. Also, tremendous psalm. If you have a chance to read it, I encourage you to do it. It's a, it's a psalm I go to often. David expressing more about who God is. And when he cries out to him that the Lord hears them and delivers them out of all of his troubles. He delivers them out of all of his fears. He's near to the brokenhearted, and he saves, saves those that have a contrite spirit. David, writing there in Psalms 34 and verse 19 specifically, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Again, that deliverance might come when he calls you home. But again, he's writing to those that are righteous. And last time I checked the word of God, our righteousness is as filthy rags. So the only nice righteousness that you and I ever carry has been imputed to us or laid to our account by Christ alone. Right? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, He that knew no sin took on sin so that we might take on his righteousness. So we gave God sin, and in return... He gave us righteousness. It was a win-win situation for us. But he has delivered us. My shield. He's my shield. Great picture here. We know what a shield is. When you think of a shield, it comes to mind right off the bat. You think of something that is uh, covering you, that protects you. We read about it in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. When Paul writing about putting on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And in that text he says that you ought to have the shield of faith. The shield of faith. And faith is the evidence of the things not seen, right? Belief in things that we can't see according to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. But in, in that we also understand that that shield is Jesus Christ. Again, I hope you understand that there is nothing we can do in and of ourselves. We can't save ourselves. That's for sure. But he's our, he's our fortress. He's my deliverer. He's my rock, and in him will I trust. My shield, the horn of my salvation my high tower. 
The high tower is a great picture of one to where we find ourselves being in a place where you think in the old days where in the nights and all of that time where they were in their high towers and they could see afar off. They could see the enemy coming long before the enemy was close. And if God is our high tower, he puts us in position, not that we always see it, but that he's always in position to see what lies ahead for he knows all things. But he is the one that can help us get through seeing the circumstance come ahead. And how do we do that? Psalms 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, right? That verse is beautiful when it talks about that when the, when the, when the word of God is a lamp unto my feet, so it shows me what's happening right now in my own life. It exposes everything, but men love darkness rather than light. You know why? Because we think we can get away with so much more in the dark. But Jesus, God sees it all. But so you know the word and the lamp is a light unto your feet and a light unto my path. So not only does the word of God show us what we ought to be doing now, but it also shows us where we ought to be going then. But it's the word. Again, proper perspective of God. Proper perspective of his word. You can't water down God. You can't water down the gospel. You can't water down who you want God to be. God is not a smorgasbord. The smorgasbord, you go and you pick and choose what you want. And people try to do that. I like this about God. God is a God of love. I'll take that all day long, right? And we'll eat on the God is love part. And he is. But God is also a holy God. And if he's a holy God, he hates sin. And if we know him as we ought to know him, then we too should also hate sin. But you and I are still sinners, right? If you know the Lord tonight, you're sinners saved by grace. But at having a proper perspective of God... The holiness of God. Yes, that God is a gracious God. He's a merciful God. Again, those are all smorgasbord areas everybody loves. Love, grace, mercy. I'll take those all day long. But God's a jealous God too, right? I don't know if I want to take that part. And holiness I'll take on Sundays. For the rest of the week, I'm not going to take holiness. Or when I'm around certain people, I won't take holiness. But I'm around my church people, I'll take holiness all day long too. But you can't pick and choose. The God of the Bible is the God of the Bible. And this is who David's describing. And this is why David loved it. And he said, not only is he just God, but he is my God. David gives great pronouns all through what he writes. In fact, 2 Samuel 22 is also found in 18, Psalms 18. Same passage of scripture there. But David would say all through the book of Psalms many things. He would also say that... We'll give you a familiar one, Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd that I shall not want. Or the Lord is my shepherd, what's he mean? I have no need for anything else. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. See, he's a personal God. He's not the man upstairs. But when our perspective of God is to minimize him and treat him like a smorgasbord, then everything that happens around us will continue to be broken down and we will just filter in with it all. But when we see God for who he is and see the sovereignness of God and understand that God is in full control and he's a God that knows me and a God that cares about me, but he also is a holy and righteous God that he has to deal with sin because of his holiness, but he can also love through that as well. 
And when we understand God in this way, then you and I have a proper biblical perspective of who God is. And no matter what happens around this, everything happening around David, I'm getting enemies on this side and enemies on this side. In fact, they are camping around about me, he writes in Psalms 27, where he says, the Lord is my light and he's my salvation. Of whom shall I fear? We continue on as he per continues to give pronoun after pronoun. He is my savior, my refuge. I love that word refuge. He's my escape. It's the place that we run to in time of need, right? But unfortunately, we only run to God when we think we need him. But how often do you need him? All day long. There's that song we sing, I need you every hour, right? If I would have wrote that song, I would have said, I need you every second. But you and I think we only need them on Sundays. Or when we find ourselves in a hard thing, then I need God. But again, proper perspective of God, biblical, holy God, you will see that you need God every second of every day. And what can you and I do? Nothing but trust him. All we can do is trust him. That's why David would write in the same chapter here in verse 31, coming to a close, he says this, 2 Samuel 22, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried or it's tested, and he is a shield or a buckler to all those that trust in him. For who is God except the Lord? Who is a rock except our God? He is my strength, my power. He maketh my way perfect. So your proper perceptive of God will help us. I'm not saying it's going to take away all anxiety, all worry, because that's still sin, and we still struggle with sin every day. But there ought to be a difference in a believer trusting the Lord in an unsaved person's perspective of God. Ought it not? But when you and I blend in with the world's perspective of God because we're afraid of offending somebody. Unfortunately, there are churches all over the world that they are more concerned about what the people in the pews think about than except that Jesus would show up and what he would think about. And the thing is that he's there anyway, right? Some churches you could argue he's not there. But I believe with all my heart that a, a right view of God will show you and I a right view of us. And this is what I think David said because David, would, yes, he had his ups and downs. He had some major ups and downs. But David was also, what did God describe David as? A man after my own heart. He was a man after God's own heart. He desired the heart of God. Was he always great at it? Certainly not. And neither were you and I. But what do you strive for tonight? Do you strive to please the one true God of the Bible? Or are you trying to please the one to whom you've created in your own mind? If you're following the one like the smorgasbord God, number one, you're totally wrong. Because then you're just really trying to satisfy your heart's desire. Or you're trying to follow the one to which David writes about here, that he's my refuge, my strength, my high tower, my fortress, my God, and my rock. And David says this in verses 5 and 6. When the waves of death come past me and the floods of the ungodly men made me afraid. You know, after all we see in our world today, the sorrows of hell can pass me about, and the snares of death prevent me. David giving some crazy description here in verses 5 and 6. But where does David go? Verse 7. In my distress, I called upon the Lord to my God. And he heard my voice. He heard my cry when it entered into his ears. You know, tonight... I can't but 
think in my own life, my own perspective of God. And I can find myself having a wrong perspective of God very easily. I can water down my own sin very easily. Oh, everybody does that. And there are a lot of sins that everybody does. All of you probably tonight when you came here, you probably broke the speed limit, probably. I know I did. You're going one mile over. Now I can water things down all my life. But when I have a right view of God, it convicts me and brings me to repentance. I've been preaching through our church right now, 1 John. Today we were on just two verses. And John told the believers there that he was writing to, I'm, I'm writing to you so that you sin not. But when you do sin, you have an advocate. You have an advocate in Jesus Christ who's with the Father. And he is the propitiation or the satisfaction for your sin. And not only for your sin, but for the entire world. You know, you got to think about what God does, not only for us, but who he is. It's easy and more uh, uh, likable to choose the things that God does for us. We like when he's our refuge. We like when he's our strength. All the things that we talked about briefly tonight in 2 Samuel 22, we like those things. And they're great. I want you to know those things about God real in your life. But I want you to see the bigger thing is it's not only what God does do we like, but we also should desire to know and have a proper perspective of who he is. We all like that he died on the cross for our sins. But do you know why? Holiness of God. One, one author said one time, out of, all the out, out of all the attributes of God, and he was not trying to make this one above everything else. He was just placing emphasis on it for this moment. But out of all the attributes of God, you never hear God is love, love, love. You don't hear that God's just, 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 that he's grace, 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 that he's mercy, mercy, mercy. But what do you hear in Isaiah 6? That he is holy, holy, holy. Amen. If you see God is holy, you'll see, your need of his, you'll see your need of a Savior each and every day. I'm not saying you have to be saved every day. But you'll see your need of that every day. And what did he do? He went to the cross once and for all. Forever. Became the sacrifice one time forever. So that you and I would have relationship. Proper perspective of him. You and I can even come into his presence. We can't even come into the holy of holies. Except without the cross. The cross. If you get nothing else tonight, I pray and hope that you will see God for who he is. See your sin for what it is. See, I would see my sin for what it is. And find myself broken before that holy God, seeking repentance. Because I believe as much as we look around our culture, our society, our nation, and our world, I can do nothing in and of that. Because as I point fingers, we always hear how many are pointing back to us. I can only see God for who he is and say, God, work in me. Change me more. Mature me. Equip me. Help me to have a proper perspective of you. And help me to be obedient. And you imagine churches doing that? The Providence Church of Coatesville did that. Every day, and I know we're, we're not going through that every day, but imagine if we did what we would do to this community. Not us. What's Matthew 5, 16 say? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and not give you any glory, but give the Father glory in heaven. But I believe it begins with proper perspective of God. And you'll see your need 
of him every single day. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this brief time tonight. So much more there, so much to express and talk about, God. But Lord, help us in our lives. For those of us that read your word and know your word, Lord, we do often have proper perspective of you, but it's, it's, it's crazy to understand, Lord, that our environment or who we're around can sometimes change that perspective or at least help our words to come out differently than, than what we really should be saying about who you are. Lord, we can follow the crowd so easily oftentimes. But Lord, as believers, you called us to be holy as you are holy. You called us to be set apart. You called us to be different. Lord, if we are light and men love darkness rather than light, or we're just reflectors of that light because you alone are the light. But Lord, if we're like that, then we're not going to have a whole lot of people wanting to know us much. If they rejected you, Lord, and we stand for you and live for you, they too will reject us as well. Because ultimately they reject you. God, I pray in my own life, Tim Cranes, that I desperately need this as much as anybody else does here tonight. Help us, Lord, if we are born again tonight, that we would live it. As Paul said, you are no longer children of darkness, but you are walking in the light, children of light, so act like it. Lord, may we act like it. And we can't do that apart from the Holy Spirit working in the life of each of us. We can't do it in our own power. God, I know that if I do anything in my own power, I fail every single time. I don't want any glory. May it all be about you, for you, and directed to you. Lord, help us to leave here tonight and go through the course of this week that we would have a proper perspective of you, which only comes by the reading and the studying of your word and the word applying to us. Being in the branch or the vine, and the vine giving us fruit to produce. Lord, I ask these things in my own life. We do pray for, our, for, for the city of Coatesville tonight. We pray for the state of Pennsylvania. We pray for the United States of America and the world around. Lord, we so all desperately need you. And Lord, unfortunately, many do not know you because they don't have a proper perspective of you. And there's no need for a savior if they don't know they're lost. So, Lord, I pray that you would show us our lostness daily so we would see our need of you daily. I praise you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen.
is holy. God is great. We're going to have prayer tonight by Sister Ray. And we have prayer cards over there in the basket. If you have some prayer requests, please put them on the cards. And we can pray for you throughout the week as well, okay? All right. Have a good evening. God bless you.